Hello, everyone. Uh, hello and welcome. Uh, this is a 2022 International Open Seminar on uh, Semiotics, a tribute to John Dilley on the fifth university, university, anniversary of his passing. Sorry for that. This is an event that stretched out throughout the whole year, enlisting a long list of incredible speakers organized by equally long list of um, international institutions and associations, uh, primarily led by Institute for Philo Philosophical Studies, the Lyceum Institute, the Dealey Project, St. Vincent College, and many more. Today with us, uh, we are honored to have two special guests. Uh, and with this, I would like to welcome Dr. Sara Canizaro and Professor Paul Cobley. Thank you both for being with us. It's a pleasure. Dr. Canizaro's speech today, The Dealey Method, an archaeological stroll across biosemiotics and cybernetics, intends to employ the Dealey notion of archaeology of concepts in order to relate certain biosemiotics concepts to the cybernetics heritage. We'd hear more from Dr. Canizaro on this, but first a few words on Dr. Canizaro's uh, profile are in order. Dr. Canizaro is a postdoc researcher on European media platforms, assessing positive and negative externalities for European culture at IULM University. She is also a research fellow for Tech Ethos, Ethics for New and Emerging Technologies with High Socioeconomic Impacts at the Montfort University based in UK. She is also honorary research fellow at the Department of Computer Science at the University of Warwick, also based in UK. She has previously worked at various institutions, including Petras, Cybersecurity, for the Internet of Things. PETRAS stands for Privacy, Ethics, Trust, Reliability, Adoption, Security, and the IoT. She also worked for Fair Space, Future Artificial Intelligence and Robotics for Space Hub. And uh, she worked for iTrace, IoT Transport Assured for Critical Environment. Prior to this, Dr. Canizaro also taught on various topics, including media and communications, digital media, research methods, and um, uh, other uh, courses uh, across several British universities. So primarily her research interests include analysis of media and digital media systems, biosemiotics and systems thinking, adoption of the internet of things, ethics of emerging technologies and so on. Here today, given this limited time window, we will only cite three of her um, selected publications. The end of CBOX century mid 21st century pandemic, modeling through and beyond CBOX systems, semiotics and science. This is published in 2021, uh, Chinese uh, semiotic studies. Another publication in 2022, uh, Trust in the Smart Home, findings from a national representative survey in the UK. And finally, published in 2018, Race in the Journal Race, Ethnicity and Education, The Devil is Not in the Detail, Representational Absence and Stereotyping in the Trojan Wars. Uh, Dr. Canizaro, apologies if we have missed anything, but uh, feel free to add. And now the floor is yours. Uh, great, um, Elma, thank you so much for your um, brilliant introduction. Um, so I will uh, now share my screen and uh, um, uh, I will introduce you to um, yeah, my presentation. Can you let me know if you... Right. Can you see? Is is that okay? Can you see one slide only, or do you see both? Um... We see both. We, we see both slides. So I'm not quite sure how to adjust that. Actually, uh, how do I how do I change this? Because I wouldn't presentation mode. Um. Sorry. What is what is what is that? 
so it's not this. Um, if you go to presentation mode, then we will see only one slide. Okay. Um, like, okay, let me just uh, uh, do one simple thing because I have two screens, so I'll, uh, I'll just take one off. I think that would be easier. Um, Uh, okay, is that okay now? Yes, it's all good, thank you. Yeah, so you can see one slide only, yeah? Yep. Perfect. Great, so yeah, apologies for this uh, technical glitch. Um, yeah, it shouldn't happen after all the technological uh, projects that you've mentioned. Um, but yeah, he here we go. Um, I just wanted to, to say, um, yeah, my my interest span from as you can see how you will see from from this presentation from um, ancient times to super modern times. Uh, so perhaps in the question there will be um, opportunity to make sense of this. But what I'm presenting here today <clears throat> really is um, uh, it's a perspective that goes quite far back. Um, in in history and uh, um, precisely it is uh, a book chapter um, from uh, this this book for which in fact I wrote a review on uh, on, on um, uh, Chinese semiotic studies uh, some time ago um, and um, uh, so it's it's a book typed by John Dilly titled Introducing Semiotic and um, from uh, 1992. And well, um, the part that I will be talking about is, is the first part, uh, which is about how one discipline invents and keeps reformulating the other in many imaginative, if reticular ways. So these are John Dilly's words, and I will uh, um, take you through what um, what this meant, and also what this um, what I thought this meant for starters, and then what it meant for me and my own work. Um, so this is about this, uh, what I think it's a masterpiece, uh, John Dilly's masterpiece, uh, uh, The Relation of Logic to Semiotics. It, it is part of that uh, book that I've, uh, that introductory, so-called introductory book that it's not exactly an introduction, as you will see. Um, it's, it's very detailed, um, but that was um, <clears throat> initially a, um, uh, a paper in an article in uh, in semiotica um, from 1981, and that was also reprinted um, in 2009 in uh, in the book Realism for the 21st Century, a John Dilly reader edited by Paul Cobley. Um, so now let's let's have a look at what this uh, um, well what this this is. For me, it was a masterpiece and very influential for my work. Uh, let's see what this, this was about. Um, so Dili, in the initial pages of this article, presents this idea of the archaeology of concepts. Um, he says that this uh, uh, archaeology of concept was uh, borrowed, in fact, from Umberto Eco, uh, one of his lectures at the first International Summer Institute for Semiotic and Structural Studies in Toronto from 1980. Um, I did try to find um, reference to this um, work from Umberto Eco, but I didn't, um, in fact. Um, however, I, I guess that uh, Echo's expression itself was perhaps, I wonder if it was inspired by Michel Foucault, Archaeology of Knowledge from 1969 as well, um, uh, which is quite detailed, but obviously takes a, a very different path of explanation. Um, but what is this archaeology of concept for John Dealey? Uh, and that's one of the, um, I think, most fascinating definition I can um, recall. It's the uncovering of the layers uh, by which concept ultimately taken for granted in some specific population acquire their illuminative power for human culture. Um, so so the key aspect here is the uncovering of layers. So we, we discovered um, something um, that has been hidden by layers of, of history. And then this something refers to what lays underneath a concept 
things, well, concept in this case that have um, been naturalized and that seems um, natural to the point of not being debatable, but they are. Um, so what shape does this take? Well, uh, Dili traces the origins of semiotic consciousness in Western culture, particularly through the history of logic. So he looks at the uh, entire, entirety of the history of logic from uh, ancient time, from Aristotle. Uh, it could have gone a bit uh, even further back, I guess, but well, the history of logic from Aristotle to um, well, to the work of Charles Peirce, so um, end of the 19th century. And that is because the history of logic provides a privilege access to the understanding of semiotics. Um, so, and also because logic concerns itself with questions about knowledge, experience and interpretation, which are um, obviously for, for Dili crucial concern for semiotics. So, um, I will now take you through the uh, through how John Dilley details this history of logic uh, as he then underlines uh, the times and the way in which uh, contributions in the history of logic end up revealing something about semiotic, end up doing semiotics or uh, contributing to semiotics. So, um, I, well, for for, the, for ease of summarization, I have identified five period. This is the first one. It's the ancient world of logic, Greek and Latin, um, starting with um, Aristotle's work, the Organon, consisting of these uh, areas, uh, categories, interpretation, prior analytics, posterior analytics, topics and sophistic refutations. Um, so, uh, Dilly says that Aristotle, through these categories, invented logic, although he did not include it in its own classification of the sciences. However, he saw it as the common or general instru instrument for the development of the science to, to go to explore, investigate um, the world with order. Um, and uh, well, I mentioned these this, uh, different um, topics here because they are repeated throughout John Dilly's chapter, uh, especially the prior analytics and posterior analytics. Um, so if one misses what they are at the beginning, which I did several times, then it becomes you know more complex to understand the rest. So I, I, I tried to make it um, uh, clear now by listing them all. Um, so Dilly then mentioned Stoic's logic um been important although the the key well the key work on on uh, logic by the stoics philosophers is lost and also part for his isagog which con which is an introduction um to logic con well not to logic as such but it's an introduction approaching logic uh, consisting of um five words looking at genus species difference property and accident and then there is augustine who is uh, traditionally part of uh, accounts of histories of semiotics. Um, however, it is inserted here in the history of logic. Um, so Dilly uh, explains that Augustine becomes central to the general history of semiotics because uh, in its intent, he his intent was to identify a very specific case of sign, uh, a conventional signs of God. So. Um, signs of the divine, the word of scriptures, for example, the sacraments and of the uh, sacraments of the church and so on. But in order to identify this, um, uh, this specific category of signs, he comes up with a series of distinction covering the entirety of the semiotic phenomena. Um, for example, uh, the idea of natural versus conventional signs or signs in animal con cognition and versus signs in human cognition. Um, and uh, well, clearly, it's uh, uh, it, 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 it very much approach uh, a semiotic uh, point of view. And then uh, there is Boetius in this, uh, um, and Boetius uh, marks the passage from the Greek 
contributions to logic to the Latin contributions to logic, because Boetius sets himself the task to translate Aristotle from Greek to Latin. Um, <clears throat> and uh, um, so it, 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 his translations of Aristotle come to us. Um, I, I think Dili mentions that sometimes it's difficult to distinguish it between well, yeah, between the work of the translator and uh, what is has actually been translated, um, and also the majority of Boetius work is lost, so it's 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 quite difficult even for this reason to make that distinction. His key contribution is ens relativum, ens relativum uh, of which signs are a special case, so a being that that, that is relative um, to something else. So then in the uh, second stage, um, we have the Middle Ages. So from we go from the classical to the Middle Ages, what Dili calls the indigenous Latin developments, um, the so-called scholastics, uh, medieval scholastics, who reflect on being, uh, they call it ends, be, ends as the first thing that the human mind grasps. So there is a key distinction here between ens reale and ens rationis, where ens, ration, ens reale refers to mind independent being, uh, and ens rationis refers to mind dependent being. Um, so an ens rationis includes uh, second intention, the subject matter of logic, or in this uh, um, beautiful expression, the order that the mind in its own working introduces into things in order to know reality. Um, also, uh, in this uh, um, period, logic is divided into formal logic and material logic. Um, formal logic is preoccupied with uh, inner consistency of thoughts, regardless of content. So regardless of how it refers, it might refer to reality, whereas uh, for material logic is the application of uh, uh, consistent thought to experience um, in order to understand why things are the way they are. Um, yeah, and this distinction is based on Aristotle's prior analytics uh, from the organos, as, as I mentioned earlier. So logic comes about as the art uh, of enabling us to proceed with ease, order and correctness, and uh, material logic uh, shines as the first treatise of scientific methodology in the West, in fact. Um, so then we have uh, um, what Dili refers to as cognition theory amongst the Latins between medieval and Renaissance times. And here there is uh, um, uh, an outlook on the relationship between logic and this understanding of real world experience and how that plays out in language. <clears throat> so um, it, there's a reflection on uh, uh, species expressed which are language shaped cognitive or, cognitive or intentional forms of logic. And this refers to the form expressed by the mind in response to environmental stimuli. And the response um, is, first of all, in terms of circumstances to be sought and uh, uh, to be avoided. So here we have an extension of the notion of the signs to these forms. Um, happen by analogy to the sign of oral communication, such as speech, but also um, signs of nature. In fact, um, if we um, consider circumstances to be sought and to be avoided, um, we can see that this kind of, Dili calls it, uh, it's, it was considered a psychology, but dealt uh, with the formation of concept, not just for anthroposemiotics, but also uh, in the zoosemiotics realm. Um, so clearly here there is, um, in fact, an impetus towards what we today uh, know as, as biosemiotics. So signs in anthroposemiosis and zoosemiosis uh, as well.
And uh, um, then there is what Dili calls terra incognita, the drift towards semiotics consciousness. Um, he talks about uh, a key scholar, John Ponceau, um, Portuguese scholar, and um, and well, the reason why he reflects on this period and calls it terra incognita is because, um, from what I understood, there is a traditional view uh, that um, in this period, uh, well, this period is actually marked, first of all, by the death of William of Ockham in 1350, uh, who is the last studied Latin thinker. And then in 1650, there is a the death of Descartes, who is the first studied post-Latin thinker. And there is this period in between uh, in which, from what I understood, traditional accounts of history um, recall that uh, scholasticism um, is said to enter nominalism. So it is, yeah, terra incognita, all, almost like a dark age, certainly for semiotics. Um, however, John Dilley, with his... Um, approach of looking at the um, history of logic in order to cast some light on uh, um, on semiotics really um, identifies uh, that there is in fact some light some light in this tunnel and that's represented by the work of John Ponceau um, who is the first thinker who debates the possibility of a general theory of science um, so it's a drift towards a, a semiotic consciousness, um, and this work is in is uh, in this summule, um, which is an introductory logic text. It's part of a course in material logic, and it treats on signs or what um, um, uh, Didi calls perihermenias. Uh, I'm not sure if I pronounce it correctly, but that means treatise. Uh, Treaties, treaties on signs, and uh, um, a couple of um, well, a couple of key aspects here is that there is an explicit critique of the definition of the sign through the um, insights coming from uh, Augustine uh, that that the sign brings something other than itself into awareness of an organism. And also, um, it's a view that um, brings something new to um, the understanding of um, scholastic understanding of um, being, uh, because it trans transcends the traditional division of being into ens reale and ens rationis, so mind independent and mind dependent being. It transcends that because the signs in uh, Poinsot's uh, work. Um, in the sign, both mind independent and mind dependent reality are found. So this is a work that uh, bridges uh, the two kind of beings in a in a unity. And the, the aim was to simplify the life for the be beginner students of logic for Ponceau uh, by reducing to unity um, all the basic issues that have been raised concerning signs. And uh, um, and yes, and this is, I think, it's one of the key contribution of uh, um, um, this this work from John Dilly, the underlining of the importance of John Ponceau. And then we have uh, a thinker, John Locke, who is also recalled a bit more traditionally in histories of uh, semiotics. Um, and in fact, Ponceau talks about, uh, sorry, Locke, John Locke talks about semiotic itself, semiotics. Um, studying in a systematic and unified fashion the means whereby speculative and practical knowledge alike is acquired, elaborated and shared. And in, even for Locke, John Locke, the object of semiotics is neither ens reale or, or ens rationis as divided, but it's both um, in the way in which they get mixed up and uh, um, complete or compenetrate, to use these terms, uh, one another in experience. 
Um, so uh, Dili um, for this period concludes that from the 17th century onwards, um, the relation of uh, logic to semiotics um, is achieved uh, both in fact and in name because uh, semiotics are in name appears uh, in fact. Um, although the achievement itself will not be recognized for another 300 years. Um, and that will be with the uh, uh, work of uh, of pairs. Um, and then we have um, um, logic in modern times um, and this specific date, because uh, um, this is the date 1866 in which um, Dilly underlines how there is a rediscovery by Charles Sanders Peirce uh, that there are two types of induction. So uh, during that period, um, <clears throat> induction had become quite um, known or popular, um, particularly after Stuart Mill's publication of a, of a system of logic. Um, so Peirce discovers that there are two types of induction, in fact. Um, it's defined as such, the movement of the mind whereby we form a hypothesis on the basis of sensory experience and the movement back whereby we confirm or inform hypothesis with reference to the sensory. So the first part, uh, the movement of the mind where we form hypothesis, so this kind of hypothetical reasoning is what Peirce called abduction, is the only kind of speculative, risky, creative arguments um, that allows um, people to recognize patterning things. Um, <clears throat> often it's referred to as the um, basic um, uh, dynamics behind intuition. It's been referred to as right guessing. I'd like to underline, however, that being hypothetical, we are talking of probability, not necessity. So a right is probably a bit too strong as a category, um, but it's perhaps about approaching what might be true or sensible. Um, sensible particularly as a, a category of what works in a specific context, since Peirce was a, a pragmatist or pragmaticist in his words. Um, but what is the key contribution of abduction here for logic? Um, I mean, clearly we don't know uh, uh, that Peirce um, makes um, an overt and explicit link to, um, to logic in his um, um, in his work, um, so logical semiotics. Um, the theory of science. Um, so, um, yeah, so abduction links logic to concerns of common life and substantives using philosophy. Substantive, a substantive, I think it refers to uh, relating um, argumentation and reasoning. Um, not simply to mathematics or inner consistency or uh, the beauty of, of theoretical um, um, reasoning as detached from actual concrete experience, but it is in fact uh, about relating to events in the world. And that's why it's um, abduction is quite important and hypothetical reason is, is important. It's, it's the realm of possibility what may or may not happen. Um, whereas induction as such is the movement where we confirm this hypothesis with reference to the sensory. And in fact, we may not even confirm it, but it's about um, um, facts to uh, hypothesis or facts to truth. So summative is what uh, uh, is the term used by John Dilly. Um, so Archaeology of concepts allows to map the complex relation of logic to semiotics uh, according to a historical layering. It allows um, Dili to explain, to uncover, in fact, that logic is not just formal logic, but um, an interpretative, interpretative activity. So it's about interpretation in relation to actual lived existence. And logic becomes 
one with a unified doc doctrine of science once uh, we adopt this uh, method, which is coextensive with semiotic itself and synonymous uh, with semiotics, in fact. And uh, an interesting uh, point um, is that the historical and conceptual link between logic and semiotics allows um, one to, well, allows deal in fact to, to um, make the link or argue that in fact semiotic is almost a push back to material logic. It's like a return of a specific aspect um, mm -hmm. that was uh, explored by the scholastics, uh, med med the medieval thinkers. And this is um, archaeologist concept from uh, um, uh, uh, the relation of logic to semiotics from John Dealey. Now, I just wanted to spend, a, you know, just a few more words about uh, what this meant um, for me, for uh, for my own work um, and, why, and my own thinking. So how did this help me uh, to grow? So my take on uh, archaeology concept. Um, so what I uh, deduced um, is the importance of um, historical and interdisciplinary uh, work, in fact. Um, so interdisciplinarity referred to as theoretical synthesis, sometimes it's called integration, but also as practical problem solving method. So there are two different things, really. One is focused on theory, the other one on problem solving, but they're both united by the general translation of one term from one discipline to the next. Um, and clearly this is present in archaeological concept, in the transferring concept from logic to semiotics and the other way around as well. Um, <clears throat> However, uh, the issue with integrative studies could be uh, that there is sometimes little attention given to the work of defining goals and methods clearly. So um, this is definitely not the case with John Dilley's work because goals was defined very clear and the method is also defined very clear. Um, this uh, method is precisely the historical layering. Um, and that's why um, I, I call this uh, this paper, the Dilly method, well, the effort in this paper, I could um, distill it into the Dilly method or the practice of reading one discipline in terms of another to illuminate tacitly established concept. And that's what I took away uh, from from his from this work. So. Um, one would have to know a lot really about the discipline uh, that it's, it's, it's exploring, but also it would, you know, one of the challenges to be selective uh, about what to include. But certainly a historical perspective could make sure that an interdisciplinary exploration is structured in historical layering rather than arbitrary cherry picking of ideas. So I suppose the idea is to um, perform interdisciplinary reasoning um well a lot of times it's been made ad hoc and i've, I've done it as well you, when you have to solve research problem and doing it quite fast um you do think of an idea that is not present in the discipline you're exploring but you pick it up from another discipline that, that you've studied that i've studied um so if you don't have a lot of time you do cherry pick that idea it you use it ad hoc um but um well, um, it really shows that historical layering would be a way to <clears throat> to structure this process, in fact. And there is this uh, uh, sentence that explains this. Um, so when you cut off what is arbitrary from all that has become naturalized in language, all that is all that is exactly what drops out: history and experience. And uh, um, and yeah, and I really like this. And just to give a, a, a bit more, I won't dwell too much on it, but just to give a, a, a bit more of an idea of how I've used uh, what I've called the Dilly method in my work. So I explored the extent to which concepts naturalizing biosemiotics, such as information, communication systems and constraints, can be related to a systemic and cybernetic heritage. So the idea was, in fact, to juxtapose some of the key um text key contribution in semiotics to uh, 
key contribution in the history of cybernetics and system theory. So the idea is that outlining the development of systemic concept in cybernetics and then in biosemiotics itself will provide a privileged understanding of, of biosemiotics. And, uh, and, and that's what I've done <clears throat> and for coming in publications too. Um, so uh, specifically the Dili method allowed me to identify that cybernetics has crossed the history um, of biosemiotics in two points. The first one is at the beginning of the 20th century with the work of ethologist Jacob von Uxkul. So Jacob von Uxkul, von Uxkul is acknowledged as, as a biosemiotician, as a proto-biosemiotician, um, but what's less known, uh, less common, is that it's also been acknowledged as a proto-cybernetician um, due to his uh, work on the functional circle and emphasis on feedback, uh, feedback communications. Um, so it, it's quite important uh, because this um, uh, acknowledgement allows us to align um, aspects of cybernetics with aspects of semiotics and biosemiotics. Perhaps uh, even more notably, or uh, more tacitly, in fact, um, is that there is another nodal point between the 1970s and the 1980s, um, a point in which the history of cybernetics and system theory or system thinking, let's say, crosses the history of semiotics. With Sibiok's work on semiotics, he was not shy of mentioning um, information theory in cybernetics ideas, um, Sibiok himself, uh, even in early biosemiotics. With the key um, link, the key passage point, really, the um, let's call it the Trojan horse. Uh, it's the Moscow Tartu semiotics which was in turn influenced by cybernetic itself. So the Dili method allowed me to uh, take trans identify transdisciplinarity and system thinking as the precursor to biosemiotics. So if I look at the history of how cybernetics ended up becoming, well, not becoming, but contributing somehow in an unexpected manner to Tartu, Mar to Tartu Masco semiotics and how that in turn contributed towards biosemiotics. Um, then we can see how the two histories of the two um, domains align. Um, so initially cybernetics was banned in Russia as a reactionary pseudoscience. Uh, it appealed to scholars in the Soviet times as a ideological, ideology, ideology free and neutral language. Um, it's coming from the sciences and from the language of mathematics. So it did bring the hope of uh, um, staying clear of ideology and the state pressure. Um, but the universal model of applicability, the result is in fact an interdisciplinary effort because this model of applicability proposed by cybernetics was assimilated in semiotics as a science aimed at the study of any science systems in human society. And that's evident in the project Soviet Semiotics, which makes large mention of, uh, <clears throat> um, uh, well, talks about modeling systems and uh, um, and and it, it it does it does mention cybernetic ideas and also the last point is that um is, let's just remember that under stalin mathematics was probably more secure than other branches of science doubtless because it was less accessible um and then later in 1964 the term originally a mathematical term secondary modeling system was used as a euphemism for semiotics uh, because the term semiotics was prohibited. So semiotics was too close to, well, to the humanities. So it was, uh, I, I would imagine that it was too easily attacked. It was too easy to identify political stances. So relying on um, a term and concept coming from a mathematical discipline helped, um, in fact, to um, carry on working, but also it gave rise to um, it gave rise to uh, the interdisciplinary, transdisciplinary effort that is Tartu, Tartu Moscow semiotics. And uh, uh, I think this is also a point made by this uh, uh, 
really nice video that I've actually found on, on YouTube about Tartu Moscow semiotics. Uh, this is Yuri Lotman, and this is uh, to explain that he actually was a soldier, um, but then migrated to Tartu and um, and uh, um, founded the what we know uh, one of the uh, most influential schools of semiotics uh, uh, of the world today. Um, and I think the video makes this point for me um, because the, the this development um, is it was unexpected. So the idea of that looking at the present from the perspective of the past, we might experience the course of time very differently. Indeed, the timeline no longer appears to us as a singular straight road, but as a bundle of equal possibilities. And that is exactly, I think, the effort that is um, intrinsic to Dealey, John Dealey's archaeologist concepts. It's, it's exactly this, um, illuminating the present from uh, um, um, aspects of the, of the past. Um, in order to see new paths and new possibilities, which are of a transdisciplinary, interdisciplinary fashion. Um, <clears throat> and to, um, to conclude, um, so for me, Dili's archaeological concept, that was an approach in that uh, book chapter article that I have uh, summarized, um, has become naturalized as a method, um, a qualitative research method um, is based on, uh, on, on, on words um, within the humanities, um, the theoretical sciences, uh, but the sciences too, uh, because there is need for articulation of ideas in a structured fashion possibly even a historical fashion in all realms, whether it's the humanities or the sciences themselves. So it did allow me to, it did provide me with the groundings to argue that the um, disciplinary overlap between biosemiotics and system thinking, while well, system theory originates in, in the historical link between Soviet semiotics and cybernetics. Um, so it did allow me by uncovering that nodal point in history where the, the two uh, disciplines cross in, in approach um, and events as well, um, it did allow me to understand, to, well, it did allow a privileged access to understand uh, biosemiotics more. So um, I can just conclude by saying that it would be good to see more testing of what I call the Dili method. Um, by means of application to more research projects in order to harness the creative power that is um, a, a, an obvious part of what I'd call this uh, method uh, being historical interdisciplinarity. Um, and, that, and that is it, and that is it for me. Uh, yeah, and that's, uh, and I'm gonna conclude here. Uh, sorry, Dr. Scanizaro, I was on mute. Thank you so much for oh, okay. the presentation. We are here and uh, we really appreciate your brief portrayal of this interesting intersectionalities uh, between historical tra trajectories, logic and semiotics, and later biosemiotics and cybernetics. So thank you very much. It's, it's a pleasure uh, attending to your lecture. Uh, in the meantime, we have uh, Professor Paul with us here uh, as an intervener to your talk. And um, uh, before uh, we will uh, give the floor to Professor Paul Cobley, um, I'd like to mention a few words on his profile for the sake of audience. So um, Professor Paul uh, is actually uh, the ninth uh, Thomas Sibiuk Fellow uh, of the Semiotic Society of America. He's the president of the International Association for Semiotic Studies and also the Secretary for the International Society of, uh, for Biosemiotic Studies. So definitely uh, we are eager to, to hear from Professor Paul on this uh, implications for biosemiotics and uh, semiotics intersection. Uh, Professor Paul is a professor in language and media, also the Deputy Dean 
uh, in the Faculty of Arts and Creative Industries at the Middlesex University. His research interests include semiotics, that includes biosemiotics, zoo semiotics, and cyber semiotics. He also is uh, specialized in the works of Thomas Sibiuk and also John Dilley. Uh, he's also, uh, uh, he's, has worked uh, intensively of communication, theory, narrative, subjectivity, popular gen genres, and especially the thriller. So uh, he is uh, the, the author of a number of books, but we, uh, we are only able to mention here a few of his publications. Uh, one of the books uh, published in 2016, Cultural Implications of Semiotics, and another one published in 2014, is the narrative. Uh, Professor Paul Kobley is also an editor with Professor Kalave Kuhl, a, a co-editor actually, of the uh, well-known Semiotics, Communications and Cognition, De Grauter Moten. He is also the co-editor with Professor Peter Schultz uh, of the multi-volume Handbooks of Communication Sciences, uh, same, uh, published by De Grauter and uh, he co-edits the Journal for Social, uh, Social Semiotics. Uh, Professor uh, Pobli also has uh, edited volumes, uh, just to mention a few, The Routledge Companion to Semiotics, published in 2009, Theories and Models of Communication, published in 2013 with Peter Schultz, Semiotics and its Masters, published in 2017 with Christian Bankov, Realism for the 21st Century, a John Dilley Reader, published in 2009, and the Communication Theory Reader, published in 1996. Uh, Professor Paul, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Th thank you, Elmer. You know more about me than I can remember. I do. I do. I, I admit that. <laughs> I'm pleased about, about that. I will come to you for reference, I think. Um, Talking about knowing um, people, uh, me and uh, Sarah Canizzaro have, have known each other for a while, and we've been in um, in numerous conversations over uh, the last 20 years. So uh, we thought that it was appropriate for us to have a, a conversation here rather than a, a paper and a, a commentary. Um, and things were already beginning to uh, occur to me as you were um giving your presentation sarah i mean in particular towards the end though it just struck me and, and um, i don't want to test your modesty by asking this but it just struck me that um while you're outlining uh Dealey's archaeology of concepts in a way your work you know particularly the work on biosemiotics and systems theory that is a new kind of archaeology of concepts, it's it's your own archaeology of uh, of concepts. Um, I I'd, I'd suggest, uh, and I, I wondered if you, there was something that you wanted to to say about that because um, that heritage of systems theory is invoked, I think, in in biosemiotics and it's invoked in other areas as well. But um, I think most people forget about this. We have this systemic and and cyclical forgetting in uh, in academia um and I, i've just noticed it in relation to to systems theory it's it's had various moments when it's come back and um uh, i think you know you demonstrated that you were well aware that uh, that that cbo could been involved in um in systems theory in the uh, in the 1950s he, he played this very sort of mercurial role between different uh, different factions amongst all those people who during the Cold War were trying to um, produce this this unified theory of, of communication or the new or almost a unified theory of, uh, of science as well. Um, so that that is often for, forgotten because it's a, a project that's um, that's dismissed, but its residues remain for um, for subsequent um, for, for subsequent uh, academic movements and, and uh, for subsequent generations. So I, I wondered if you, you saw yourself as, um, you know, absolutely in that work, an enactment of, um, of the very principle of archaeology of concepts, not just a method, but like a new archaeology of concepts. Oh, I see. Um, 
Okay. Yeah, that is testing my modesty. <laughs> um, um, well, I, I, I had to. Um, I understand what you're saying. I had to have a take on it. First of all, I had to work on on trying and understanding it because uh, uh, you know that chapter has got uh, an abundance of details, and then uh, distilling um, a, a kind of a procedure. Uh, let's put it like that. Um, but you're right in the fact that I had to take ownership of uh, uh, developing some of that procedure. I knew some of my own procedure to that. Um, and I mean, the way I did that was that I, I, um, I outlined um, aspects. I separated the. Uh, I categorized the history of cybernetics and system thinking in um, in, in periods uh, quite orderly. So from proto cybernetics to first order cybernetics, second order cybernetics, and and then general and, and system theory, social system theory particularly. Um, and then uh, I've tried to um, map that onto um, selected um, contribution in biosemiotics. So I suppose the way in which I've taken ownership of, of that approach was in um, in making this selection. Um, and uh, um, it was not easy, but it was the most natural thing to do. Uh, it is as if, uh, you know, it's just a, a road that was inevitably going to take me there. So, you know, Sebiok has done work in cybernetics in the 50s, as you said. And uh, if he had done work in that field, it was inevitable that I would, you know, I would pick up on um, cognate, perhaps distinct, but cognate efforts, you know, the work of uh, um, Soviet scholars um, on cybernetics and how this morphed onto the 1970s uh, semiotics then which then became a Tartu Moscow semiotics. Perhaps what I want to say is that what I have um, proposed um, is an understanding of uh, um, commonality amongst discipline, at least these two disciplines, but perhaps this can be replicated in itself in terms of transdisciplinarity. And by that, I mean the focus on systems, then um, history, and by that, I mean a phylogenetic um, outlook, and finally function, and uh, uh, and by that I mean looking at causes that are, you know, uh, traditional mechanical past causes, causes in the past, what causes something to be now, but also final causes, you know, which is the um, teleological input of semiotics, and by the way of cybernetics too, or very old cybernetics work as well in the 40s you know it was a lot of that work was about teleological systems so so i guess my own interdisciplinarity my own um archaeology concept is based on these three pillars uh, transdis transdisciplinarity as system history as phylogeny and function as causes initial and final causes and um so yeah if i was to be not that modest that's what i would say I, I think it's perfectly warranted. Um, <laughs> and I think it's, you, you set that up um, perfectly because um, transdisciplinarity um, and uh, phylogeny and um, what was the third one? I forgot. Function, that. function in terms of causes. Uh, yeah, and final cause, absolutely central to, um, to uh, biosemiotics. So if you were doing a kind of um, semiotics of biosemiotics, you know that was, that that is what you would would come up with. But I, I I do want to return to those. But another thing that um, that occurred to me when you were were talking, um, and this is very underdone, I think, in in daily studies. I, I I think that that you foregrounded it, and it was um, you know it was really pertinent, uh, and that is um, Dealey's insistence, which. Both of us have witnessed um, a close hand on historical layering in um, in uh, in referencing. Now, you know, and also in, in thought, you know, in method and uh, and in thinking. Um, so, in a way, um, although it's it's relatively seldom mentioned, the big contribution that um, that John Delius made. 
is in the SSA style sheet. It's absolutely <laughs> fantastic. He, he um, didn't invent it completely. The, the historical layering, I think, is is a- absolutely his, his insistence on that. But some of the design of it came from uh, early publications by, uh, by Mouton. Um, so he's introduced the historical layering in, in particular. For, for people who are not aware of this, because it may just pass you by as another style sheet or another uh, means of, of doing references, uh, Dealey insisted that all references be historical in the sense that you couldn't have a late edition um, referenced for uh, a historical author because he insisted, and I think he's right, that um, nobody writes anything um, significant after they're dead. In fact, nobody writes anything at all after they're dead, significant or insignificant. So you have to give the original date of um, of publication, even though there are you know post- posthumous publications in our field, which is um, uh, semiotics. If you think of the foundational work in semiology, um, so sure, it's published two, two years after his death. So um, nevertheless, you have to pay historical attention to it. And I was just thinking this this um, uh, point that. Um, Certainly, I've seen it very often in my career that there are cycles and there, there are resurgences of particular uh, particular viewpoints. You know, it's not a, a chronological progression of ideas that we uh, witness all the time. Um, you know, sometimes ideas from many decades or, or many centuries before become uh, absolutely current. Uh, and they get recovered, you know, in the same way that Dealey says that there's a recovery of the uh, the consciousness of the late Latins, for example. Mm-hmm. Okay, so all of those things happen. Um, does does that square with historical layering, or is historical layer, layering um, attempting to do something um, different? It, it, or let me put it the question another way: Does does historical lay, layering um, neglect or fail to take into account these resurgences and these um, these cycles of ideas that um, that we witness so often in um, in academic life um I think it's rather the other way around that this uh, resurgence resurrections of ideas perhaps of experiences um, often forget, themselves as in they forget that the same issue must must might have happened in the past so in fact i think it's the other way around it's these recurrences forget about historical layering as a as um um i think as a fundamental approach to to probably to the entirety of life uh just to make a very grand statement um so i'm it's quite easy to feel, you know, in particularly in moments uh, of, uh, let's say, let's take crisis. It's, it's, it's easier to talk through extreme, extreme, but let's say moments of crisis, it's quite easy to think that we are the only people experiencing crisis and that we are unique in that sense and we are the only people suffering. But uh, um, then, uh, you know, taking a um, historical layering approach, then, um, well, you, you do know that that's not the case. And uh, um, I think it's about, there is some moral lesson to be learned there. I'm not quite sure what that is. Maybe it's it's about responsibility, maybe moral responsibility. Maybe it, it's a push towards um, a respons- responsibility towards future generations as well. Uh, perhaps there is there is some something to gain there. Um, you know, from a creative point of view. Um, but I think it's also th- soothing because when you know that you are not alone in suffering and that a lot of other people have before you, I'm not, I'm talking about a specific case, um, then uh, I, I think that's illuminative. Um, I have a specific case in my mind. Um, so, um, uh, um, if you take the current conflict 
you know, Ukraine-Russia conflict. So um, I've, I'm told that I've heard, I've read uh, that life for Russian academics is quite hard. Some have got to fight. Some, you know, they have to leave or hide so that they don't have to join the army. Uh, some get banned from uh, um, academic circles uh, as it has as it has happened. Um, and, um, you know, I've heard that humanists particularly are, are, are in trouble because, you know, the, their political stance is easier to detect. In fact, uh, whether it's critical or not of governments of, of, of Russia or Ukraine, it doesn't matter. But as long as there is politics involved, then, you know, it's, it's easier to fall into trouble. And, um, and I've, I've, I've been told that, in fact, people who do mathematics are slightly more sheltered. And this strikes me because this current situation, it's exactly the kind of situation that I've read about in books that I've showed on my slide. And, you know, about, um, you know, mathematicians being safer in post-war time in Russian academia and uh, uh, humanists having to borrow models from mathematics, coming up with modeling system theory. And guess what? That gave rise to a key contribution in Tartu Moscow School of Semiotics. So I, I think what I'm trying to say is what's happening today has got a striking resemblance to what happened before and what happened before is clearly a crisis but also the birth of modeling system theory modeling system modeling system theory so i just want to conclude by saying sometime we're taking this um approach the historical layering approach can give you some hope you know if something unexpected an unexpected academic contribution happened out of the crisis 60 um, 80 years ago, then uh, well, who knows what's going to happen this time? Sarah, uh, thanks for that. Uh, it's almost the perfect uh, answer in a way because you, you deal with the big issues, but you've made me think about, you know, the more more local ones as well for, for us, you know, in, in our um, profession. I mean, in, in particular, um, you know, the... the Dealey mentioned this so often that um, histories of philosophy just assume that nothing happened between Occam and Descartes, you know, so, uh, which is e e easy to do. Oh, good, we can skip that period. We don't have to think about uh, about that. You know, we we don't have to do any historical uh, layering because you know Descartes, the the modern world starts with uh, with him, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So that that was um, was John's argument, but also um, you just reminded me of an issue that I, I discuss with uh, with various people every day and that is that um, you know as I get older and it might be a symptom of me getting older it seems to me that that nobody does any literature reviews anymore they write their articles you know on a topic that has been well covered for decades elsewhere and they write their articles as though they're the, the originators of these theories you know, and the originators of, of knowledge in these particular areas. So there is that kind of um, amnesia. You know, sometimes I think it's worse than um, uh, than amnesia. And um, but I I won't um, dwell on it. You just made me um, made me think about this. So you made me um, you you gave me the kind of comfort that uh, that you referred to before knowing somebody else is a fellow sufferer but of course you know i made it all about uh, about me and all my gripes about the contemporary um academy i wanted to say something else though um that's uh only slightly related uh, and that is that in respect of of you and your work we're quite privileged to have you here because all semioticians I think have experienced in their life where they have to do semiotics on the side. They have to do lots of lots of work in the um, the home institution, for example, or in their home country, and then they do a little bit of semiotics on the side. Sometimes they're keeping the semiotics that they do um, secret, even though it's the thing that they're most interested in, and so on and so on. Um, but. I think uh, you are in, in particular uh, somebody that's that's remained with with semiotics, uh, but you've got 
this other body of work as a as a researcher that you've uh, you've p- pursued um, different research projects over the years in a truly transdisciplinary fashion um and when you've been doing these have you um in any way consciously implemented the dealing method the archaeology of concepts um okay that's um um that's so that's a good question so um yes i i have slowly but steadily developed um worked in semiotics alongside um works particularly postdoctoral works on uh, um in, in other areas, in fact, in areas and fields outside of the humanities, in the social sciences and sciences, and sometimes even in in the sciences themselves. So, um, 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 so uh, yeah, in in a very much in a transdisciplinary and interdisciplinary fashion. Um, in fact, I, I'd say that was made possible by the fact that um, I have internalized. Um, I think the learnings, um, my learnings on uh, on you know the interdisciplinary and historical drive uh, from the Dili method, so that has become second nature to me. I don't even have to think about um, you know making an effort to do that. So um, you know whenever there is a, a problem to solve, then it's quite obvious for me that. If I'm trying to solve a specific analytical problem in in a in a field, then it's quite obvious that um, it would it be useful to look somewhere else as well, in some other field. So that's that's second nature to me. Um, so um, so yeah, this method is this approach has uh, has become very very useful. Um, so in a way, I keep on doing semiotics, but this kind of um, transdisciplinary sometime historical work I, I keep on doing that um, as part of my work um, I think so that, that that's something that I do you know um, um, just just as a natural part of problem solving when you know when I find myself to be on a fast pace high pressure research project you know funded by external organization research councils and so on um, and thank God I can rely on this uh, on these resources because there is hardly any time for reflection you know you have to crunch problems crunch data and deliver um, I suppose the um latest issue that i've been trying to solve but it's not solved yet but it's somewhere it's an area where i'm i've been thinking about i've been in fact actively thinking about whether i can apply this method and uh, how to do that um is the fact that i'm working on um um ethics of uh, uh, emerging technologies and the task I, I have with the rest of the team of, of course is to um, enhance existing ethical guidelines for um, a specific technology that is climate engineering um, so enhancing means evaluating evaluating means that you got to have criteria criteria means that you can take criteria from guidelines within the same sector but then you end up doing the same thing all the times you have to take criteria from outside of climate engineering research into ethics. Perhaps you have to question the very basics of ethics itself. Aspects of the history of ethics, you know, ethics as ethics as compliance, ethics as prescription, ethics as instinct and uh, as well, in fact, and uh, an abduction and, you know, the things that um, are more part of semiotics, which are not traditionally part of ethics, I've, I've learned. Um, so now I'm trying to, in fact, these days I've been trying to think about how to um, crack this problem using uh, interdisciplinarity and perhaps structuring it with historical layering. Um, so a way to evaluate and enhance uh, guidelines is to look at other guidelines, perhaps looking at them in a in a in a in a historical fashion um, or looking at a set of ideas that can formulate criteria in a historical fashion. I'm thinking that could be a way that could be a way to crack this. So that's that's just an example, but it's not solved 
problem yet. Well, I mean, John Dealey certainly did that. You remember, he did these studies that the people thought were just etymological studies of um, of where various uh, words in semiotics, including the word semiotics, came from. Um, so, um, I, I mean, in that dimension, certainly um, worthwhile. But just as you were, you were talking, um, the um, and, and this is just a you know completely. Um, off the cuff and um, on the hoof um, comment or observation. I, you know, I don't know if we're going to crack this one, but I, I was wondering if you know that there's a, a crisis of, um, of uh, replicability in, uh, in Western research, you know, in particular in psychology, you know, the, there are so many approaches that are just not replicable at all, you know, so, I mean, effectively, we're saying that they're not scientific. I mean, just a quick one, because we won't crack this in any way, shape or form. But do you think that um, what you've just described is a, a one way in which we can combat this crisis of replicability? Oh, I see. Um, um... Yes, because just uh, relying on uh, on uh, transdisciplinary efforts, so picking ideas when and as you need them ad hoc, which is the easiest thing to do um, when you're borrowing, uh, then uh, it gives ideas. It gives ideas. It, it, it's it's a creative act, um, but it's not structured. So it is, in fact, probably not exactly replicable. But once you do that, I think with uh, with an extra um yeah structuring factors so not just borrowing from a different discipline but borrowing from um a set of ideas developed along a timeline from a discipline uh then i think you are introducing a frame of reference and and i think that is um in terms of method i think that's that is something that you can applicate uh then i'm you know, results-wise, I I don't know. You know, um, it, yeah, yeah, that I don't know in terms of results whether um, what happens. But certainly, you can be um, more confident about your method, and that's I think what Dilly meant when uh, he said it's just the way when you take arbitrariness out, arbitrariness out of the equation, then you're left with history and experience. Well, that's a great quote. If it is a quote, I didn't didn't recognise it, but it, it's it's good. Um, uh, what, what, what you just difficult for most people, um, I think. You know, in in uh, the academy, I mean, difficult to grasp. Sorry, was my voice slurring? Was I freezing there for a moment? Yeah, it did freeze for a for a moment. Yeah. Oh. Okay, I was, I was just saying that, that it's a, a, a big challenge. I mean, the, the other day, um, I have a, a PhD student and she's, you know, she's uh, well read and she's, she's bright and so on. And I was delighted to hear her say that she'd um, started to read your um, PhD thesis. Oh, wow. I said, good, keep reading. And, um, you know, she got the general sense of, um, of what you were trying to do with, you know, one discipline in terms of another but she said, oh, it's really hard. It's really challenging. <laughs> um, and, you know, uh, you and I have d discussed it, and I, it never occurred to me that, that um, as, a, as a conceptual challenge, it's, it's really um, quite considerable. Uh, do, do you get that, that sense now? I mean, I know you've been working in the field and you've been using this, this method, but do, do you think it would be difficult to, to get other people to um to to accept it or other people to to find their own ways of doing the same kind of work okay um well i guess the, clearly each person has got to find their own entry points to to this um so it's interesting to know about that reaction because that was exactly my reaction when i came across john Dealey's piece <laughs> and not just back then but every time i read it I'm thinking, oh my God, this is so complicated. How could I ever understand it now? How did I understand it before? So, <laughs> so that's my reaction every time. And I've read that piece several times across, you know, 
like 20 years, like you said. Um, so I think that's fair. Um, and that's probably how it, it, it should be as well. Um, I suppose the, in terms of challenge, uh, one way to keep in mind is, well, we all have our own individual entry point to, to this. Um, patience and time because uh, to come up with to, to just to come up with understanding the method and applying it to if, if I remember well to my first chapter um, uh, it did take three years but once I have done that I wouldn't say the rest was downhill but a, a big part for me a big part of the puzzle was um, was solved in fact um, so, that is, so in, in that case it's just a, a reminder about you know the importance of uh, uh, giving time for for learning to occur that's not always contem contemplated i think in a three-year project um i i think um but you know there isn't always more time for that in fact when time is a constraint so in for my subsequent subsequent postdoctoral work. So now that I have to think about ethics and guidelines in, in a shorter time frame, in a few months, not in a few years, um, I think the key is selection. So having shorter histories. So, um, so being selective with text. So for example, I like I outlined a, a, a series of guidelines, ethical guidelines in, in, uh, in climate engineering, about 15 probably, but then decided I'm, um, I'm going to focus uh, on uh, just one or two. And also in terms of what criteria to look for, instead of just relying on the entirety of the history of a discipline, again, I would rely on you know, um, time allowing, uh, I would rely on two or three uh, contribution from a different discipline, but linearly or historically, maybe not linearly, but historically arranged. So I think the key to that challenge is um, accepting that it takes time, but also uh, making, managing, so uh, selecting, being selective. That's what I would recommend. Well, on the on the one hand, the, you are um, recommending, you know, slow research, like, like the slow food movement and then on the other hand you you are outlining the realities of what it's like to work in a lab where you have to get results very quickly and you know um very well as a european that the all the um grant awarding bodies all, all the the uh, research councils and so forth they they always insist on um impact so I, I sometimes think that, that European research in the future is not going to be academic as such. It's going to be like um, impact hit squads, and it's not going to have the long, you know, slow research um, complexion that uh, that probably a lot of us who are on the call today are the last um, last generation of um, of ever um, enjoying that. Um, does that seem the case to you? Um, yes, absolutely. And that's continuously my experience as well. Um, it is as if, uh, um, you know, we have to develop work and crack problems in order to, you know, have a deliverable. And uh, um, it's got to be structured, it's got to be rigorous, but at the same time, for the sake of uh, managing the work, because quite often it's a lot that has been promised on those proposals. It's a lot more than what can be delivered. But in order to, to be able to deliver, then you have to make choices. You have to cut corners in some ways. And, um, and, and well, basically what you do is that you solve the problem uh, in the... It's got to be done with an intellectual layer, but then you kind of resort to thinking, well, but I will do the proper academic work afterwards. <laughs> I finish the deliverable and then I work on the article. Of course, there is never time to work on the article. If you do, it's got to be in the night, on the weekends, or when you are unemployed looking for the next contract. <laughs> to be honest, that's my experience. Um, but to do the kind of slow research that takes time to and, and patience to mature, um, it's, it's got to be done in your own time. I think the, the, the project of this kind gives a hint and um, in fact, sometimes doing things fast can uh, unravel something quite important 
then you got to find the dedication, commitment, resources to be able to um, to develop further. And I think that's the approach I'm um, I'm trying to use uh, the ways to survive this. Well, I, I I don't want to end on that, um, you know, somewhat bleak outlook, <laughs> the occupational outlook. So something a little bit more open ended to um, uh, to uh, process of the final question, and it might be be one that uh, that's equally helpful in in practical terms. We have on this call, I think. Let me just see if he's still here. We have uh, my friend um, Didier Sar Effer from France. And he, he's working for the um, International Association for Semiotic Studies, trying to um, to uh, uh, rejuvenate through a special interest group our sense of what is uh, semiotic analysis and what is semiotic method. Um, because if you look at certain fields that are... Um, less well have have less of a following than uh, than semiotics and are much younger than semiotics for example critical discourse analysis as a method in the humanities it's almost entirely accepted to the extent that you can sort of um, put your finger on the drop down menu and it's one of those those items there almost you know so we have, we have a crisis for for different forms of um, for, for different forms of semiotic analysis in the sense that we certainly aren't on lists for um, legitimate methods uh, for grant awarders, for example. So yeah, my question to you, you know, and maybe the, the other people have questions uh, related to this, is would you say that semiotics now is a matter of method or is it a matter of theory, or is it both, or is it neither? Right, um, it's, it's a really good question. Uh, so relating it to my personal experience, um, this the answer has changed according to the stage I've been at, the stage of learning and but work as well. So the kind of personal learning, but also institutional, um, you know, career, um, institutional, uh, stage. So um, semiotic has been theory for me in my formative years. So during my studies and during my PhDs and right after my PhDs, um, where I did have, um, um, well, it was a moment of discovery and um, and it, it, it just, semiotic theory for me, it's about, uh, well, um, it is about like falling in love is where concept and approaches and something clicks and then you know it becomes a part of how you see the world I see the world in terms of communications and connections and relations and that has remained so theory for me was fundamental it has changed and it's still like that today it has just changed the way I see things as a human being um, then uh, semiotics became method afterwards when uh, uh, well, after my formative years, I have to um, find the place, you know, in academia. And um, then this outlook becomes uh, something that I argue it's a, it's an effective, useful way of uh, solving problems um, uh, in different disciplines. That means you are more marketable. That means it's easier to convince people uh, well, not easier, but you have more chances to to be called for interviews, for example, when you can solve problems of a different kind. And that's exactly what has happened to me. And on, on this, I'll just uh, mention that once at a job interview, I was asked um, by a very puzzled interviewer, um, how did you go from semiotics to cybersecurity? You know, uh, the answer for me is just the most uh, uh, obvious one is when you have, uh, you know, a uh, 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 when you see connection in things, then, uh, you know, the, the, there isn't a division between semiotics and cybersecurity. There isn't. It's just a natural line of continuity. You solve a problem in one field and, and, and you do the same way. Sorry, you use the same approach in the other, even though the subject matter is different. In that case, semiotics has become method for me. 
I would expect when uh, my position would be more settled, then semiotics will be back to being a matter of theory. Uh, perhaps when, well, that's my hope and expectation um, to be able to have like a second stage of formative reflection, perhaps, you know, patient reflection and, and contribution. So um, I think it, yeah, so in short, I think it depends on, for me, the answer depends on what I've been at. But something that I want to say, Semiotic as methods, it's clearly not semiotics as just a simple method of textual analysis in media studies. Definitely not that. That's not what I've done. I have used semiotics, as I said, in the social sciences and sciences. Um, I've tricked colleagues into doing semiotics and them not knowing that they were doing that. So, so yeah, semiotic as a, as a method uh, in all fields, areas of knowledge. Thank you. I mean, just very quickly, um, and incidentally, <laughs> the the observation on um, on semiotics and cybersecurity um, at the IASS Congress in Thessaloniki in August, the Australian scholar, she's now in the UK actually, um, oh. Kay O'Halloran made the, um, the the same observation about uh, semiotics and cybersecurity. She gave a keynote address. Um, so I, I was listening to you saying that and thinking, oh, yeah, I heard that already. Oh, wow. So, so you're vindicated. Elmer, I'm <laughs> sorry if we've, um, we've gone over. I don't know whether you wanted to, um, to leave some uh, space for, uh, for other questions. I'm certain that, that other people would like to um, continue on the call. So we normally go uh, uh, off stage for further discussions and questions with the audience. So everybody is welcome to stay back. At the same time, we can close the streaming uh, with the announcement that we will have again the guests on the 10th of December, which is next Saturday. Uh, the good self, Professor Paul and Dr. Sara Canizaro again. So we are very pl uh, pleased to have you uh, next Saturday on the topic of uh, a global enterprise, Dili, Sebeok, and the SOP to Cerberus in semiotics. SOP to Cerberus uh, sounds like enigmatic to me, but I think I'll be patient until next uh, week to learn more about it. So with this, uh, I guess uh, we can uh, close off the streaming. Thank you very much to Dr. Sara, and thank you very much to Dr. Uh, Dr. Professor Pobli. It's been a pleasure having you here, and we are very excited to have you again back next week. Dear Elma, before the Q&A, we beg the floor for a brief moment, if it's okay. We would just like to say on behalf of the Coimbra Institute for Philosophical Studies, uh, its scientific coordinator, Professor Dr. Mario Santiago de Carvalho, all its members, the entire organizing committee, and its chairman, William Passarini, the Scientific Council, the Board of Institutions, and everyone involved in the IO2S DILI, that we hereby extend a token of gratitude to the International Association for Semiotic Studies for all the support over the past 12 months or so of service, and most notably to its president, Professor Dr. Paul Cobley, its webmaster, Dr. Nacho Sigal, and several of the IASS members who have been collaborating with us under the sign of their commitment to semiotics. We are all inexhaustibly grateful to you. Thank you.